Okay, we begin again. First, second, third John for beginners. This is lesson number two in that series. Title of this lesson, Walking in the Light. We'll be covering first John chapter one, verse one uh, to chapter two, verse 29. Well, last week we began the study of first John by reviewing the character and the history of John himself, John the Apostle, and the circumstances in which he wrote his, uh, this, uh, this series of a, uh, epistles. I'm not going to review the information about John, but I do want to briefly look at the reasons for writing the letter because it's very important we understand that before we actually get into the text. When we understand the reason for the writing, it will help us understand the nature of the debate going on. Now in the first century, the main non-Jewish group to enter the church were the Greeks. They brought with them many of their former ideas and philosophies which they tried to merge with Christian thought. One of those ideas was the notion that in order to be saved, a person needed certain special knowledge which would transform them from a physical context to a purely spiritual context. Usually the secret instructions involved restrictions about certain foods and other types of ascetic practices. Now this idea was called Gnosticism and it was causing several problems in the church at the time. First of all, they were trying to change the teachings concerning the character of Christ in order to fit their philosophy. They had an idea about how the soul was saved, how the soul was freed, and they wanted to merge that idea with the idea of the gospel. And it wasn't quite fitting well, so they were kind of forcing the two ideas to merge together. Now, since the apostles taught that Jesus was fully God and fully man simultaneously, the Gnostic teachers had trouble reconciling the idea that a divine being could dwell in the form of a man because they believed that spirit was purely good and flesh was purely evil. And in order to you know, have salvation, the spirit had to escape the flesh. And so along comes Christianity and says, well, here a divine being, spirit, dwells in a fleshly body. So they were having trouble reconciling those ideas with their previous thinking. They taught that you were one or the other, but you couldn't be both. And certainly not both at the same time as the apostles claimed Jesus was. And so their solution was to claim that Jesus was only a spirit who appeared to be a man. He wasn't really flesh. He was pure spirit, that's okay. That accounted for his purity, his sinlessness, his power. You know, he was pure spirit, but he only appeared as a man. He wasn't really a man. There was really no flesh there. Of course, this violated the apostles' teaching and reduced the Christ to the status of a, a, a ghost or an apparition. Not the divine Son of God coming as a man to die. You have to be in flesh to die for sin and raised from the dead. Again, you have to be in flesh to be raised from the dead in order to conquer death for all of mankind. Their uh, teaching was meant to control the minds and the lives of others, not to free others with the gospel of Christ. And I want to tell you some, just a, an observation here. The gospel is always about freedom, not about restriction. It's about freedom. Certainly not freedom to sin willingly, but it's about freedom in life. We, 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 Christ came to set us free uh, from the law and uh, from the ravages of sin and not restrict us further than we already are restricted in many ways. Also, this doctrine also undermined the effect of correct doctrine by causing Christians to doubt their salvation by Christ and doubt their own eventual resurrection. So imagine the questions now, if this is what you're being bombarded with, with this Gnostic idea. If Christ was a ghost, then who died for my sins? I mean, the entire Old Testament premise of a vicarious sacrifice, you know, animal sacrifice, in preparation for the Lamb of God, the human sacrifice of Jesus, all of that goes out the window. So who died for my sins? A ghost? 
Or are my sins dealt with by the cross or by my own efforts to learn and apply this secret knowledge? Is that how I'm saved? I used to think, according to the apostles, that I was saved because I believed. Jesus did this for me. But if this is true, then I've got to do something. I've got to learn the secret knowledge. I've got to apply the secret knowledge. Thirdly, if Christ was an apparition, is there any bodily, physical resurrection for him or for me? Because if, if he's not physical like I am and demonstrates to me a physical resurrection, how do I know, what assurance do I have that I will have my own physical resurrection? I mean, if he's just a ghost, I'm not a ghost. I'm a real you know, flesh and blood person. And the promise that I understood was that my flesh and blood would resurrect in a different format, but it'd still be me. Okay. And then fourthly, if he was a ghost, is that what I will become also? Will I become a ghost? Is that what I will be? So to counter this dangerous teaching and bolster the sinking faith of the ones affected by it, John writes a letter that has two main objectives. First of all, to establish the true identity and character of Jesus. The apostles had already done this with the gospel message, but it seems that he needed to, to you know, reestablish this idea with them. And secondly, to restore confidence in the disciples that they could be sure of their salvation. You know, the, the Gnostic teachers created doubt and fear. And so John is writing to reinstill in them confidence concerning the surety of their salvation. So today we're going to review 1 John chapter 1, verses 1, all the way to 229, where John describes the Jesus that he knew personally and one of the three ways that they could be certain, not just for sure, certain of their salvation. So we begin with the historical Jesus, uh, John chapter one, beginning in verse one. He says, what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. And the life was manifested and we have seen and testify and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us. What we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. These things we write so that our joy may be made complete. So John was an apostle and the criteria for being an apostle, if we remember, was that you had to be an eyewitness of Jesus' life from His baptism at the hands of John the Baptist all the way through to his death, burial, and resurrection. You, you had to be a witness of that in order to qualify to be one of the 12 uh, apostles. This means that when he writes this particular letter, he writes as a person who has seen personally the life and the death and the resurrection and yes, even the ascension of Jesus. He writes about what he has witnessed, not conjecture, not opinion, not hearsay, not what he heard somebody say, but what he actually saw. Remember, these Gnostic teachers never met Jesus. They never had any contact with him. So John begins by establishing the idea that he, as an apostle, he has had contact with Jesus. And between the lines here, he's saying, who are you going to believe? The one that actually you know, lived with Jesus for three years? or these teachers who are simply you know, bringing a philosophy based on their own thinking, never having met or interacted with Jesus himself. So in the end, his readers must choose to believe what he teaches based on what he's seen or the Gnostic teachers' secret wisdom based on their philosophies. Now he doesn't refer to Jesus by his given name, but by titles that he has and qualities of his nature and position that he has used before in his gospel record. In other words, in these first four verses, he uses a lot of terms that he used in his gospel, in the, uh, the prologue of his, uh, in the gospel of John. For example, in verse one, he says, what was from the beginning? Well, you know, in, in John chapter one, verse one, 
he talks about Jesus was there at the beginning. The word was with God. All right. Uh, the, he, he, he refers to Jesus in verse one as the word of life. Again, another, uh, uh, another statement taken from uh, John chapter one. Uh, in verse two of this epistle, he calls uh, Jesus the life. In verse two, he calls him the eternal life. Another place in verse two, he says he is with the Father. Another place in verse two, he says he was manifested to us. All of these terms here are, 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 are terms that he used previously to describe Jesus in his uh, gospel. Now in verse three, he finally gives the name of the person he has referred to in six other ways in the previous verses. These titles are given and used to establish the divine nature of Jesus Christ. So, first of all, he was at the source of creation in the beginning and time. And that's what begins, okay? That's, that's, that's what begins time. Time begins with creation. Uh, he embodies the life-giving word. You know, God spoke the creation into existence. And John is saying, Jesus is the embodiment of that word, of that creative power. If that creative power were, were formed as a human, it would be Jesus. That's the point he's making here. Uh, he says that Jesus gives life in the sense that he is the life-giving spirit in human form that we might recognize. He also says that he is eternal. There's no beginning or end. If you were there at the beginning of creation, it means you were there before creation. Well, uh, the beginning of creation is the beginning of time. So if you were there before the creation, what you're saying is you're before time, you're eternal. He says that Jesus is with God. He has been made manifest, meaning he's been revealed, meaning that the true nature he possesses has been made known through divine revelation. We could never guess it. We could never see it. We could never intuit it. The only way we know about Jesus is that he has been divinely revealed to us through God. All of these terms can only be applied to a spiritual being, thus establishing Jesus as a fully divine spirit. Do you understand the point that he's making? He's using all these titles and he's using all these descriptions of Jesus' presence and eternity and power and abilities and so on and so forth to convey the idea that only a divine being could be referred to in this way. And that's how he's saying to his readers, this Jesus, he's divine, he's God, he is a fully divine spirit. Now, John also mentions that he knew or experienced Jesus in another way, in a very physical way as well. He heard Jesus speak, he mentions in verse one. He saw Jesus with his eyes, again he mentions in verse one. He touched him with his hands. I mean, this would not be possible if Jesus was a ghost. If he was just a, an apparition, if he was an apparition, you couldn't touch you know, and feel the warmth of his flesh. You couldn't hear you know, the, the tenor of his, of his voice and see him move about. Let's face it, I don't want to you know, make it too simplistic here, but you live with somebody for three years, walking up and down the dusty roads between you know, Galilee and, 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 and Jerusalem and you eat with someone, and what do you think? They, they slept in houses, they slept outside, they slept in inns. You see them eating food, you see them you know, going to the restroom, you, 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 you watch them uh, you know, sit and, and, and wipe their brow from, from fatigue. You know, when he stopped in the, in the village and, and asked for a drink because he was tired and thirsty. I mean, you have that physical interaction with an individual. You're pretty convinced after three years that you haven't seen a ghost. This is a real person. So my point is John here is arguing that Jesus is a divine because he has all these you know, titles and powers and the revelation that God has given and B, he's fully human because he's had an experience. He's seen him and touched him and heard him. All right. So according to John, Jesus is no vision. 
He was able to interact with him just like any other human being. As a matter of fact, what Jesus has received from God as only a divine spirit could receive, he has given to John as only one person could give to another. And John is passing it along to them in his gospel and now in this particular letter. Of course, what he's passing along is the good news surrounding the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ and the offer of eternal life to every person who believes. Those are the terms of the gospel. Those who believe are the ones who are saved, not those who learn about the secret knowledge. So the eternal life, or this eternal life, is seen or described as a fellowship that all believers have together they have it with the apostles, they have it with Jesus, and ultimately they will have it with God. And so when you talk about eternal life, you're talking about a status, you're talking about a dimension, you're talking about an experience, not just time, it's not just eternal like you know, forever and ever, but it's a, it's, a, it's a context, it's an experience. And John is saying that eternal life is the experience of a conscious life with not only you know, the apostles and the saints, but also the apostles and the saints and Jesus and the Father as well at one point. That will be the context and the experience of our eternal life. The fact that we are associating and in fellowship with in real time, in, in, in reality, in consciousness, we will have that experience. This is the promise and the reward of the gospel. And so John concludes by telling them that the purpose of his letter is to encourage them to remain faithful so that John and the others might rejoice in their faith because there's no joy for them if they fall away. You know, what joy is there if they fall away? There's no joy. Now the next section gives the readers a first way that they can be certain of their salvation. Remember, they're struggling with the idea that Jesus may only be an apparition and John has shared his firsthand contact with the Lord, with them. They also have begun to doubt of any real change, um, if any real change has taken place, if they truly have been saved. Am I really saved? You know, how should I feel about that? How do I know that I'm saved? Well, what, 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 what are the markers? You know, how can I be sure? So they want some kind of evidence that will confirm that they are truly spiritual and truly eternal in nature and thus saved. John responds by saying that one way they can be certain of the transformation in themselves is to note the difference in their present lifestyle compared to their past. Again, John uses a figure of speech to convey this idea. For the Jews, as well as the Gentiles, the term light represented what was true and good and pure and spiritual in nature. And so walking in the light meant that one's life reflected these characteristics, you know, purity, goodness, truth, so on and so forth, spirituality. It was another term for a saved person. You have to understand that. So light represented what was best, good, true, pure, spiritual. Walking in the light meant that you were walking in that, you know, in that, uh, uh, in that nature uh, with those qualities of your life. And uh, if you were walking in the light, it meant the same thing as you are saved. A saved person has this experience. A person walking in the life has this experience. You see the parallel there? So walking in the light meant that one's life reflected these characteristics. It was another term, as I say, for being saved. So in chapters one and two, John names four areas where one's conduct determined if they were truly in fellowship with other Christians, with John as an apostle, with Jesus and the Father. Remember, the whole idea, the whole promise is we will have fellowship together eternally the saints, the apostles, Jesus, the Father, okay? And he says, if you're walking in the light, it's a guarantee that you are now and will continue to have fellowship with, with these. So he says, examine your conduct. And if it matches this, you have a guarantee that you are a saved person, an eternal spirit, that you are walking in the light. Now we don't have time to read and analyze every single verse, but in essence, there are four areas that he talks about here. 
The first area of walking in the light is personal behavior. Chapter one, uh, beginning in verse five. So let's read that. He says, this is the message we have heard from him and announced to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. By this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. The one who says I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. So personal behavior, walking in the light, one testimony of it, one witness that a person is walking in the light, you examine your personal behavior. A person who is walking in the light and thus a surf person is a person who recognizes certain things about their personal behavior. And here they are first, that they are sinners. How do you know you're walking in the light? By your personal behavior. What personal behavior? Well, first of all, I recognize that I am a sinner. I don't hide or pretend that I'm not a sinner. Secondly, the people who are walking in the light don't pretend that they are good, but secretly practice sin. In other words, they're not hypocrites. Thirdly, they confess their sins and they seek forgiveness on a regular basis. Fourthly, he says, they understand that without the blood of Christ, they cannot be cleansed and walk in the light. I mean, you know you're walking in the light when you recognize that you are a sinner that you make an honest effort to abide by God's word, but you depend completely on Jesus' blood to keep you clean and worthy and saved. That's what walking in the light is, for starters anyways. You know, walking in the light is not living a sinless life. People make that mistake all the time when they read, are you walking in the light? Meaning, you know, are, you, are you living a, sinful, a sinless life? Only Jesus lived the sinless life. Now walking in the light is recognizing and acknowledging that you are a sinner. You know, the light meaning I see the light, I understand who I am, and who I am is I am a sinner. And I rely on Jesus' sacrifice to keep me pure as I attempt to obey Him as best I can. That's why He says, if you say you don't have a sin, you're, 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 you're delusional. If you claim you have no sin, but you know you do, but you just won't acknowledge it, then you're a liar. So you're either delusional or you're a liar. But the one who's walking in the light, he says, recognizes, oh yes, I am a sinner, but, but every day I depend on Jesus' blood to make me right, to keep me in the light. And I make an honest effort to obey His commands. Secondly, second way we know we're walking in the light by examining our social relationships. Let's read verse seven. He says, Beloved, I am not writing a new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you've heard. On the other hand, I am writing a new commandment to you which is true in Him and in you because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. The one who says he is in the light and yet hates his brother is in the darkness until now. The one who loves his brother abides in the light and there is no cause for stumbling in him. 
But the one who hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. I am writing to you, little children, because your sins have been forgiven you for his name's sake. I am writing to you, fathers, because you know him who has been from the beginning. I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I have written to you, children, because you know the Father. I have written to you, fathers, because you know him who has been from the beginning. I have written to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. So a person who is walking in the light and thus secure in their salvation is a person who loves their brother and sister. You know, there's a hierarchy of importance in Jesus' teachings. They're all divine. All of his teachings are worthy of respect and obedience, but some are weightier than others. You know, Jesus said this himself. Switch over for a moment to Matthew 23. What did he say? He says, woe to you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier provisions of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. But these are the things you should have done without neglecting the others. So the Lord placed an attitude towards others, especially those in the body, as a primary importance and issues surrounding church structure and worship style and so on and so forth after that. For example, one who worships correctly, one who has proper understanding of doctrinal matters, but fails to genuinely love his brother, fails to walk in the light and will have to bear the consequences. You know, if you're going to make a mistake, better it be in church matters and issues of, uh, 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 and issues of, of true meaning of difficult passages, you know, who is the man of lawlessness? You know, in, in first and second Thessalonians, Paul, Paul talks about the man of lawlessness. You know, a lot of debate about who the man of lawlessness, some thinks it's this person, it's that, it's a movement, it's an idea. Who's the man of lawlessness? Better we don't get that right. We, we, we make an error there, an honest error about what we think about that, than not loving our brother and sister properly. That, that's what he's saying. Some things are difficult to understand. Some things are difficult to apply. But it's very easy to understand that we ought to love one another. And Jesus is saying, this is, this is more important. He mentions here, you notice he goes back, the young, the old, the children. He mentions the young and the old because all are responsible for these things. The younger may not be mature in the understanding of the more complicated doctrines, but they are responsible to love one another. Teenagers may not understand, uh, you know, in the youth group, they may not have done a deep study yet in the book of Revelation to find out what it means and who it refers to. But they're old enough to understand that they should love one another. That's the point he's saying. Everybody, children, old men, young men, everyone. Young and old leaders and followers, all are responsible and capable by God's spirit to love one another and failing to do so is a reflection of darkness, not light. Love is the surest sign of divine light in our lives. So you want to be sure of your salvation? Examine your love. Examine the kind of love you have for your brothers and sisters, and that'll give you an answer. The third way, walking in the light. Examine your separation from the world. Verse 15, he says, do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. I have to repeat that. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life. The lust of the flesh is the stuff that I want, my flesh wants to be gratified. The lust of the eyes is the accumulation of things, new things, shiny things, bigger things, more things than others. And the boastful pride of life, look at what I have done, look at what I have accomplished. John says, these things are not from the Father. These things are from the world. The world, he says, is passing away and also its lusts but the one who does the will of God lives forever. Oh, wait a minute, lives forever? 
walks in the light, is saved, has the fellowship with the apostles and Jesus and the Father, all the same thing. Who are those people? The people who do not love the world. This is a response to that secret knowledge business that was going on that said that entry into a pure spiritual world was achieved by leaving our bodies. And the way to do this was by giving up certain foods or legitimate sexual activity within marriage and other ascetic practices. And John says that the proof that one is walking in the light is that a person separates themselves from the world, not from their own bodies. That comes at death. He urges them to give up worldliness. In other words, excessive love and preoccupation with physical things, things that simply gratify the senses. Give those things up by recognizing that this world and all that is in it is temporary and will ultimately be destroyed. You can have things if you understand that those things are not what gives you joy, happiness, peace of mind, and certainly assurance of your salvation. You can have a trillion dollars cash in your bank account and it will not contribute a, a, a single moment of peace uh, insofar as knowing that you are saved and guaranteed heaven. Ten trillion dollars. How about fifty trillion dollars? No, not at all. You know that you're walking in the light, saved, fellowship, right? When your final goal your primary goal is going to heaven and not necessarily making yourself comfortable here. And then one more way, the fourth way to examine if we are walking in the light, and that is if we have adherence to the truth. He says, children, it is the last hour and just as you heard that antichrist is coming, even now many antichrists have appeared. From this we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us. But they went out so that it would be shown that they are not of us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One and you all know. I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father. The one who confesses the Son has the Father also. As for you, let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. This is the promise which He Himself made to us, eternal life. These things I have written to you concerning those who are trying to deceive you. As for you, the anointing which you received from him abides in you, and you have no need for anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things, and is true, and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, you abide in him. Now, little children, abide in him, so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink away from him in shame at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone also who practices righteousness is born of him. So walking in the light is demonstrated by teaching the truth. And John states that the truth of God is the fact that A, Jesus is the Christ, the Savior, and B, Jesus, the divine Son of God, came in the flesh. That's the basis of truth for the gospel, for Christianity. This is the essence of truth. It's the dividing line between false teachers and their teachings and true teachers and their teachings. And he warns them against the many false teachers. He calls them antichrists who will teach something other than this. We see this in the movies, you know, the antichrist, somebody with their head twisting and huge horns and stuff like, you know, he, he's merely, not, not that they weren't dangerous, but he's referring to false teachers here who didn't have horns and you know, uh, look like devils, just ordinary men and women, I guess, who were teaching what was false. This is a reference to the, especially in this epistle, to the Gnostic teachers and their doctrines, among others. Uh, going out from us means they left the teaching of the apostles. It doesn't mean that they were members and they left and they taught a different idea. It means 
there, there is this teaching and whoever uh, does not hold to the teaching of the apostles goes out from them and begins teaching something different. The anointing that he talks about is the reception and the maintenance of the Holy Spirit who proclaims and maintains the pure gospel message in us and through us. We've received the gift of the Holy Spirit to indwell us, to power us, of course, to live a Christian life, Romans chapter eight, and to resurrect us from the dead through that power, but also to power us in the work of proclaiming the gospel and doing it accurately. In the end, John says to them that they have received the truth through the inspired word of the apostles and he calls this the anointed or the anointing. You've been anointed with the truth, not when you can jump, and down and, you know, jump up and down and think you can speak in tongue. You've, you've received the anointing of the spirit when you've received the truth of the gospel and you've accepted it as true for yourself and responded to it. There's the anointing right there. So they're walking in the light so long as they continue to hold fast to these words and not abandon them for other teachings, especially the teachings of these Gnostic teachers. So John gives them four ways uh, to assure themselves that they are walking in the light, that they are saved, that they are in fellowship, the saints, the apostles, Jesus, God the Father, he gives them four ways to remind themselves, to reassure themselves that they're in that union. First, their good conduct assures them. Secondly, their love of others assures them. Thirdly, their focus on heaven assures them. And their hold on the gospel also assures them. And so he finishes by telling them that if they assure themselves in these ways, they will be confident and happy when Jesus returns, not afraid, and of course, not afraid and ashamed of their conduct. So if they know Jesus, they know how to act, and acting in the way he could have, you know, he could have them act, and these are the four ways, uh, and if they do that, in other words, you know, if you're not sure, examine the four ways of conduct, examine the four things that reassure you, and work on these. If your conduct's not good enough, well, you know, step it up. If you're not loving others the way you know you ought to, then step it up. If you're too worldly minded and you realize that the world's got too much of a hold on you, well, step it up, change your focus. And if you've doubted the gospel, double down. Study more, reassure yourself. So they're not just you know, stayed things that are just there, they are ways to improve the sense of confidence that you have. All right, next week um, we're going to talk about the second way to be certain of our salvation, right? Here, uh, this week we talked about, or John talks about, walking in the light and the various ways that we know that we're walking in the light. Uh, next time uh, we're going to look uh, at another way to be sure of our, uh, uh, at our salvation that John uh, talks about. And uh, I'll give you another reading assignment, 1 John 2.28, follow up. Uh, two, three, uh, verse 24. Uh, as you notice, I do read them, but we kind of go through it quickly. So if you're familiar with the passage, it'll help out. Okay, that's our lesson for today. Thank you very much for your attention.